can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the homepage and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. from Ghana. Pastor, why is it that believers praise men of God after deliverance and not God? I'm asking because I have seen and heard believers praise pastors instead of God after a miracle. Well, I'm not very sure that you are interpreting them correctly because um, there's a, a difference between praising God for something and thanking someone for the opportunity of making it available to you or coming to reach you. It's an appreciation. For example, you may be thanking a man of God for teaching you God's word. Or for even praying for you. Not for answering the prayer. There's a difference between the two. So I think that these believers are smart enough to know what you're talking about. And they, they must have been truly praising God. While you thought that the praise was to man. I think they're smart. So um, give them the credit for being smart. Henry from Nigeria. Jesus told the thief by his right hand side on the cross of Calvary that this day you will be with me in my father's kingdom. But Jesus spent another 40 days before ascension. So where was this thief all the while? <laughs> Since the Bible says no man has ever gone to heaven except Jesus. Well, it's one of those um, virtual contradictions that you know people pick out from the Bible. They think there's a contradiction here. There's no contradiction at all. The, the problem is a, a misplacement of the punctuations by the um, translators or those who copied the manuscripts. There's a misplacement of, of punctuations. So I'm going to put the punctuations right and then help you understand it. I'll read to you from St. Luke's Gospel chapter 23. And from verse 42, talking about that thief who was uh, on the right hand side of the master. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee. That word translated verily is the same word truly. It means truly. I say unto thee. Today, now you notice after the word thee, you got a, a comma there. And says, today shall thou be with me in paradise. Well, um, that's where a problem of the punctuation is. It's truly I say to you today. Truly I say unto thee today. So the punctuation, the comma there should be after the word today. 
not after the word thee. So, verily I say unto thee, today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. You see, I say to you today, I say to you this day, I'm telling you today, you shall be with me in paradise. That's what Jesus said. Because you see, Jesus didn't go to paradise that day. When Jesus died, he first went to hell. Because you see, he, he carried our sins. He carried our sins. The Bible says on his own body, on the tree. Actually, it was on his spirit. And he went to hell. In our place. He was resurrected, or he resurrected the third day. So if he meant that the thief would be with him that day in, in, in paradise, Jesus didn't go to paradise that day. And just like you rightly observe, he was here after that 40 days extra. And so you're asking questions of where was the thief? Well, I'll tell you where he was. Um, neither Jesus nor the thief went to, to paradise that day. What Jesus said was, I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. And Jesus went to hell. Uh, and you know, he went to hell, like I said, because he went in our place. We were condemned. He, he took our place of sin. And that thief also had gone to hell. You see, but there was something here uh, because he accepted the salvation that Christ brought right there on the cross. He would have gone to Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom was the side of Hades where the righteous people waited until the redemption should be consummated. Now, when Jesus went there, he defeated the devil. He led captives in his train, and the Bible tells us that he brought them out of Hades. And if you would study in St. Matthew's Gospel, you would find how that when Jesus came out of the grave, before he actually, let me read to you what he did. In St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, from verse 51, it says, now, before he was um, he was buried, you'd find an account from St. Matthew here. He says, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. This was why Jesus was on the cross. Then he tells us something here. Verse 52. And the graves were opened. The graves were opened. There was an earthquake when Jesus was on the cross. When he died, there was an earthquake, and the graves opened up. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection. They came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. So, these many righteous, who were in Abraham's bosom, were brought out of Hades, by Jesus see he led captives in his train he brought them out of Hades the Bible says he led captivity captive all right now he brought them out of Hades and the Bible tells us they went into the holy city and appeared to many There's so much to be said about that but then at the ascension of Jesus at the ascension of Jesus you would find that these righteous men and women had gone to the heavenlies to wait for the master because the bible tells us here wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses a cloud of witnesses which means is referring to people a cloud of witnesses now a cloud of witnesses you would find he refers to them in the book of acts and when he had spoken these things verse 9 chapter 1 when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. A cloud received him out of their sight. Received him out of their sight. What does it mean a cloud? He's referring 
to a cloud of witnesses. They received him out of their sight because they waited for him. You remember uh, when he got to the heavens, he said, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. And the voice said, who is the king of glory? He said, the Lord, strong and mighty. He repeated his instruction. And the question came back again, who is the king of glory? And then he said, the Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. He is the king of glory. So he had conquered the adversary. He had conquered the world for us. He had won the victory. And he led the captives in his train. You see, so Jesus went with them into heaven, into paradise. So that's what the Bible teaches. And um, I hope you would always remember that, especially about the punctuation changes. Henry from Nigeria. Jesus told the thief by his right hand side on the cross of Calvary that this day you will be with me in my father's kingdom. But Jesus spent another 40 days before ascension. So where was this thief all the while? <laughs> Since the Bible says no man has ever gone to heaven except Jesus. Well, it's one of those um, virtual contradictions that you know people pick out from the Bible. They think there's a contradiction here. There's no contradiction at all. The, the problem is uh, a misplacement of the punctuations by the um, translators or those who copy the manuscripts. There's a misplacement of, of punctuations. So I'm going to put the punctuations right and then help you understand it. I'll read to you from St. Luke's Gospel chapter 23. And from verse 42, talking about that thief who was uh, on the right hand side of the master. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee. That word translated verily is the same word truly. It means truly. I say unto thee. Today, now you notice after the word thee, you got a, a comma there. And says, today shall thou be with me in paradise. Well, um, that's where a problem of the punctuation is. It's truly I say to you today. Truly I say unto thee today. So the punctuation, the comma there should be after the word today. Not after the word thee. So... Verily I say unto thee, today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. You see, I say to you today, I say to you this day, I'm telling you today, you shall be with me in paradise. That's what Jesus said. Because you see, Jesus didn't go to paradise that day. When Jesus died, he first went to hell. Because you see, he he carried our sins he carried our sins the bible says on his own body on the tree actually it was on his spirit and he went to hell in our place he was resurrected or he resurrected the third day so if he meant that the thief would be with him that day in 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 paradise jesus didn't go to paradise that day and just like you rightly observe he was here after that 40 days extra and so you're asking questions of where was this thief? well i'll tell you where he was um neither jesus nor the thief went to to paradise that day what jesus said was i say to you today you shall be with me in paradise and jesus went to hell uh, and you know he went to hell like i said because he went in our place we were condemned he he took our place of sin 
And that thief also had gone to hell. You see. But there was something here. Uh, because he accepted the salvation that Christ brought right there on the cross. He would have gone to Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom was the side of Hades where the righteous people waited until the redemption should be consummated. Now, when Jesus went there, he defeated the devil. He led captives in his train. And the Bible tells us that he brought them out of Hades. And if you study in St. Matthew's Gospel, you would find how that when Jesus came out of the grave, before he actually, let me read to you what he did. In St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, from verse 51, it says, Now uh, before he was, um, he was buried, you'd find an account from St. Matthew here. He says, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. This was why Jesus was on the cross. Then he tells us something here. Verse 52. And the graves were opened. The graves were opened. There was an earthquake when Jesus was on the cross. When he died. There was an earthquake. And the graves opened up. And the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints which slept arose. And came out of the graves after his resurrection. They came out of the graves after his resurrection. And went into the holy city. And appeared unto many. So. These many righteous. Who were in Abraham's bosom. Were brought out of Hades. By Jesus. See, he led captives in his train. He brought them out of Hades. The Bible says he led captivity captive. All right? Now, he brought them out of Hades. And the Bible tells us they went into the holy city and appeared to many. There's so much to be said about that. But then, at the ascension of Jesus, at the ascension of Jesus, you would find that these righteous men and women had gone to the heavenlies to wait for the master because the bible tells us here wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses a cloud of witnesses which means is referring to people a cloud of witnesses now a cloud of witnesses you would find he refers to them in the book of acts and when he had spoken these things verse 9 chapter 1 when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. A cloud received him out of their sight. Received him out of their sight. What does it mean a cloud? He's referring to a cloud of witnesses. They received him out of their sight because they waited for him. You remember uh, when he got to the heavens, he said, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. And the voice said, who is the King of glory? He said, the Lord, strong and mighty. He repeated his instruction, and the question came back again, who is the King of glory? And then he said, the Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. He is the king of glory. So he had conquered the adversary. He had conquered the world for us. He had won the victory. And he led the captives in his train. You see. So Jesus went with them into heaven. Into paradise. So that's what the Bible teaches. And... Um, I hope you would always remember that, especially about the punctuation changes. Quick vote question of the week. We gave you four questions from the several that we've been getting. Does God love everyone equally? Are children accountable for the sins of their fathers? Should Christians observe religious holidays? 
You didn't choose any of those. Why did God give man the freedom to choose? That's the one you chose. Now many scholars have questioned God's sovereignty and the freedom he gave to man to make choices in life. Some choices made by man have resulted in his destruction. Knowing this, why then did God give man the freedom to make choices? <laughs> you're like you're asking, uh, uh, why then didn't God make man a dog? He already had one. Why didn't he make him a cat? He already had one. See, the cat doesn't have freedom to choose. The monkeys don't either. But man has the freedom of choice. Why? Because Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 popular verse of scripture I read that into 27 and God said let us make man in our image after our likeness let us make man in our image after our likeness let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth so god created man in his own image in the image of god created he him male and female created he them god said let us make man in our image after our likeness meaning god made man to look like him and to function like him they make him like a cat or a dog they can't make decisions on their own they have no power of choice but we do because god wanted us to be in his class of being that's what he did he gave us it's a gift the freedom to choose is a gift now that somebody has misused his gift is not to say something was wrong with the gift God not only gave us the power of choice, he even told us what to choose. He even showed us what to choose. And let us know the danger of making the wrong choice. He did. So you can't blame God for the power of choice as being responsible for the wrong choice. No, no, a thousand times no. It's like those in a democratic government doing the wrong thing and saying, why did you put us in office? See, you put us in office and that's why we did the wrong thing. You put us in office and then to blame the people for choosing them. No, they exercised their right to choose, make leaders and they did. You don't blame them for having the right to choose. You blame them for making the wrong choice see so the right to choose should not be withdrawn from them or the constitution that enabled them to have the right to choose should not be cancelled they should only be informed so they can make the right choice the next time so what you need is the right information to make the right choice if you can study the word and know the word and know what God wants you to choose that's why we preach so we can make the will and purpose of God known to men all over the world. So they can make the right choice. So the information is what you need. Not to, re to remove the power of choice. Or blame the one who gave you the power of choice. Saint from Namibia. Pastor, can you please explain to me what dedication is all about and how important it really is? As a born-again Christian, why is it important to get your children dedicated? St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, from verse 22. Now, the scriptures don't directly instruct us on that, but gives us clear guidance on what to do from verse 22 and when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished they brought him to Jerusalem 
to present him to the Lord. Now, I was talking about Jesus Christ when he was a baby and just a few days old. The Bible says, when Mary's days of purification were ended, she brought her baby to Jerusalem. According to the law of Moses, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. To present him to the Lord. Verse 23, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every meal that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Now, what this means is that in the law of Moses, God had said that when a child was born as the first child, really the male, he said, shall be brought to the house of God, shall be brought to the Lord as an offering to the Lord. Now, the woman also had her offerings to give according to the law at the end of the days of purification. That was why Mary had to do this. So you notice there are two things here. First was Mary's own condition, and then the child had to be brought to the Lord. Now, that was in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we all belong to God. Now notice that this child was to be brought to the Lord as an offering to the Lord, because the Lord said, every man child that opened the womb belonged to him. Now, the other children, belong to the parents so God made a choice but we all are now in Christ now if that child that was chosen by the Lord being the first child had to be brought to the Lord to be presented to the Lord formally it just explains why we do it we all now belong to the Lord every child whether the first or the second or the last Every child that is born of a Christian should be brought to the house of the Lord to be presented to the Lord. Because now it's not just the first child or the man child that opens the womb, but every one of us that is chosen of God. We all belong to Him now. And that's why we do it. Rita from Ghana. Pastor, I want you to please explain the difference between sin, transgression, iniquity, and trespass for me. All right, now, very simply put, um, first, it's important for you to, um, these are simple words. You can go to a good dictionary and have them defined for you. But in simple terms, sin is a misdeed or an offense against a law. It's a misdeed. And then transgression and trespass are related both of them are a violation of a law an infringement of a law and then trespass is more particularly an overstepping of one's bounds and then lastly iniquity iniquity is gross injustice gross injustice and wickedness now all of these are put together as sin in generic terminology because the Bible says sin is a transgression of the law so the all together as far as the Word of God is concerned but the technicalities um, is what I'm explaining to you Crispin and Crespin is from Zambia. I want to know more about the tree of life. Was it a particular tree or an instruction for an ordinary tree? In Proverbs, there are a few more definitions. Pastor, what is the tree of life? Well, the tree of life was a real tree in the Garden of Eden, according to the Bible. Like you had the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There were other trees, and the tree of life was one of them. In fact, after the Lord drove Adam and Eve out of the garden, he sent an angel to take care of that tree of life, to make sure nobody went there. But in the book of Proverbs and in several other places, the tree of life is used as a metaphor for what the real tree of life was supposed to do. Then again, in the book of Revelation, it's referred to, and in that place, it's an actual tree of life. So 
uh, it was a real tree when it was uh, in the Garden of Eden back in the book of Genesis. Joy is from the UK. Dear Pastor Chris, why is it that after Jesus healed some people, he asked them not to tell anyone? Whereas for some, he asked them to go and show themselves to the high priest or something. What was the significance of this? Well, when he healed someone whose case was evident, like healing a blind man, those around the blind man knew he was blind. If he was lame, everybody knew he was lame. And Jesus said, don't tell anybody because it was obvious. See, if he went out of here, they would see the difference. He wouldn't need to say anything. And they'll begin to say, what happened to you? And that's exactly what happened in the Bible. Then when he healed somebody whose case was not obvious, he said, go tell them what the Lord has done for you. Like when he healed the, the madman, he said, go tell them. Because he knew if the madman began to speak sensibly, they would believe. But if he kept quiet, they would, they would still think he's the same man. See, but if he began to speak sensibly, they would know a change had taken place. So he said, go tell them. So don't be quiet. Now, for the lepers, he said, don't tell anybody, but go to the priest. The reason being, leprosy, the, the law said something about leprosy. If a man was cleansed of leprosy, you see, the body couldn't tell that he had been completely cleansed. Even if he didn't see the, the, the rashes and um, the calluses on his body, or even if the extremities that were cut off had been restored, that would not be enough because there was an internal part of leprosy and the priests were the ones who were um, given the instructions by the law on how to test for leprosy to know whether someone has been cleansed or not and if someone believed he was cleansed the law said he should go to the priest who will satisfy him cleansed and that's why Jesus said don't tell anybody but go straight to the priest and offer for your cleansing now if you went to the priest and say i came to offer for my cleansing he would say are you sure let me test and he would test according to the law and then when he declared the man cleansed of leprosy he accepted the offering before the man could go openly and tell others that's why jesus did that Julius from Nigeria is asking, were Adam and Eve the first people on earth? Yes, the first human beings on earth. The first human beings. They were the first people. They were the first that God created in his image on earth. So that's what the Bible says. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The first man. He calls him the first man and he says Adam. So that's the first Adam. Nadia from Sweden. Dear Pastor Chris, I will start by saying thank you very much for all that you've been doing, for blessing the lives of thousands and millions of people around the world. Pastor, if you're born with your destiny and later on you don't give your life to Christ, can you still be who God said you were going to be? Of course not. Of course not. There are two destinies at work, Pari Pasu, for every individual in the world. You got to understand this. There is the natural destiny that is formed by your peers, by your parentage, by your society, and, and, uh, and all your actions or inactions. All of that would create a certain kind of destiny for you. You can run away from that. But there is another destiny. It is called God's destiny for you. That's specific for you. That destiny only begins when you're born again and there are many people who live and die without ever starting the life that god chose for them that's sad but it's true the more you learn god's word the more you discover this to be a reality see you may not be the man or the woman that god called you to be or chose you to be you can live a hundred years without even entering and many have including Christians. Listen, the most important thing in your life is to fulfill God's destiny for your life. 
is to discover what God called you to be or made you for and to chart your course and be that man or that woman. But that discovery only begins when you're born again. That's when it even begins. And then through knowledge of God's Word. Remember, why I stress knowledge of God's Word so much is that God said, my people are destroyed. He didn't say Satan's people. He said, my people. My people are destroyed, paralyzed, crushed, reduced for the lack of knowledge. God's own people can be reduced to nothing, can be destroyed, can be made ineffective, paralyzed, become inefficient because of the lack of knowledge. How important knowledge is. He said for us to meditate on his word regularly. He said day and night so that you would prosper wherever you go. And he says through that you will make your way prosperous. You will make yourself successful. You can become successful. You can prosper if only you would meditate on the word of God. Ernest from Austria. Dear Pastor Chris, I would like to know what I can do to find favor from the Lord and also how to grow in divine favor. In St. John's Gospel, chapter 1, the 17th verse says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Jesus has already brought grace and truth, truth about God, reality. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth Grace is God's favor bestowed upon you. That grace has come. That favor has come. You don't need to pray to the Lord to give you favor now. You don't need to ask Him for any favor now. You don't need to find favor from God now. He's already made it available. Christ has brought it. That is the gospel. That's what it's all about. When we say we're preaching the gospel, we're saying that the grace of God has now been extended to man, extended to everybody. You don't need to ask him for any favor now. He's brought you all the favor because he's brought you his grace. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, from verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace. That means take advantage of the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That's what he's saying. Take advantage of the grace. The grace has come. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Let me read you one more. Galatians chapter 2 from verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the Lord, then Christ is dead in vain. He says, I do not frustrate, make ineffective the grace of God. See, he says, I, I don't make it ineffective. I take advantage of it. So that's what you're supposed to do. Now, what you have done so far in your life is to make the grace of God, the favor of God that has been bestowed on you, ineffective. You haven't acted on it. So as far as your personal life is concerned, you have frustrated the grace of God in your life. So you have to change things now and take advantage of it. First, declare it, say by yourself, the favor of God is directed toward me. I have God's favor. I will walk in God's favor. I have God's favor today. And I'm living in it now. You must say it. You see, the saying part of life is so important. Salvation comes through the saying. You see, in Romans chapter 10 verse 9, the Bible says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth, Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It says, For with the heart man believes. Man believes on the righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation that means with your mouth what you say about that salvation will catapult you into the realm of its manifestation so the same thing happens here in the grace of god you must say it first you believe it because i read it to you here you've read it now you believed it after believing it in your heart that the grace of god now belongs to you you must say it you must say, I have the grace of God. I live in the grace of God. God's favor belongs to me and I'll function in it today. You've got to say it. And when you say it, you activate it. It comes alive in your spirit. And from then on, you find yourself enjoying the grace and the favor of God. That's how it works.
Kululeko from South Africa. Why is Jesus not revealing himself physically or in dreams to each person since he wants everyone saved? Wouldn't that have been the easiest and most effective way of converting people? See, um, think about this. Could we be so wise as to let God know what he should have done? The Bible says in his wisdom, he chose how to save men in his own wisdom. And you're, you're suggesting for God. The Bible says, how could you counsel God? How? How could you counsel him? I want to read something to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. See, this preaching or preaching uh, it sounds foolish, seems foolish to some people. Why are you doing this? Why do you have to do this? Why do you have to preach everywhere? Those are the kind of questions they ask us sometimes. Why do I have to do this? Uh, can God just manifest himself to others? Can God just show himself why you have to do this for him? For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Did you get it? It pleased God. This was, he was pleased to do it this way. He was pleased to do it this way. After remember on the road to Damascus, he showed himself to Saul of Tarsus, called him by his first name, knocked him out blind, and Saul, in his fright, gave his heart to God. Don't forget that. But he didn't choose to do it that way for everybody. He has the ability, but he chose to do it this way, preaching to you through human beings. can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures, click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. Listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God.
preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the homepage and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. from Zimbabwe it is said that no one comes to the father except through Jesus so how about those people who died before Jesus does it mean they are not going to heaven Pastor Valley tell us this. <laughs> we believe that there are from God's word we find out that there are different dispensations mm -hmm. uh, God had, uh, saved men in different ways and you, there were the dispensation of the law the law has been abolished and those that were in, even before the law, the Bible says in Romans that men were saved by their conscience, excusing them or accusing them. But we also notice that everyone seemed to have been in a waiting place. So when Jesus died, he went to, he descended to hell. And he, the Bible says he led captivity captives, he took captives in his trail. And we understand that there was, in hell, there were two sections. There was Abraham's bosom and there was the other section. So, invariably, it looks as if it's Jesus Christ that is also saving them in quotes. Not that their salvation is through believing in him, but the Bible says it left, led captives in his trail. So, the dispensation that a man lives in is what determines how he should be saved. It's crucial. It's to, very crucial. To the kind of salvation he has, he has. And what group he belongs, belongs to. to. Okay. Same thing? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. In fact, the Hebrews even actually says it. It talks about how the gospel was preached to them mm. as also to us. And it was referring to those in the Old Testament, but it was called even the gospel. The gospel. So there's a gospel for their dispensation. Yes. The so time. it depends on which um, which dispensation you're referring to. So those who came before Jesus, the two groups, you have those who lived under the law, and so they will, they will be judged by the law. That's what the Bible says. And then those who were not under the law, but they came before Jesus came, will be judged without the law, if they were without the law. The Bible says, if they were without the law, they had their conscience to accuse or excuse them. Um, so that's that. But then remember that when, when Jesus died, all men were in him. He died for everybody. Those who came before him and those who came in his time and those who came after his death. So it's for everybody. That salvation is for everybody. And uh, if they were looking forward to him, then they had their cash checked, as it were. 
or, or rather their check cashed. Yeah, they had their check cashed, which means they had a promissory note if they believed in him before he came or they, they knew something of, the, of his word or knew something of the coming Christ and looked forward to him. So Jesus would have brought that salvation to them and they would be among those who now have received the true salvation because they believed. They're like, you're, you're thinking about men like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They came before the law, but they looked forward to the Christ coming. They knew the message of redemption and they were waiting. So the law wouldn't have, uh, they, they wouldn't have been justified by the law or even condemned by the law because the law was not there while they were here. So they would be saved because they knew of that salvation and hoped in his mercy. Now those who never heard about him would have to remain in the dispensation of conscience. And they will not be part of that church. So here's the difference. They will not be part of that church. You have righteous men who were righteous with the righteousness that God allowed them to have according to their conscience. And they will have a different class from those who were saved in the gospel, whether before Jesus or after his redemption. But we don't have all the time to give you more details, which I would, I would have wished, but maybe some other time. All right. Um, BG. Now, I, I, there's another name that you added there. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I don't want to pronounce your name wrongly. But you're from Germany. And the question is, first of all, I want to tell you that I've been tremendously blessed by your teaching, such as increase in grace and success through the Holy Spirit. I was reading the article posted on your website titled Prayer in the Name of Jesus, which says that as Christians, we don't need an intermediary between us and the Father to pray through Jesus. That I said to pray through Jesus to make him an intermediary. I would like to understand this teaching in relation to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, which says there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus. Now, that's very simple. He says there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. That's a mediator between God and man, not between man, uh, between God and, 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 and his children. Between God and man, that's Jesus and so he came as our uh, uh, intercessor, not intercessor, as our intermediary, as our mediator between God and human beings. And that's why he brought salvation. And now that he has brought salvation, we have received Christ. We are born of God now. We are children in the house. We have been reconciled to God in Christ Jesus. So now... We don't need an intermediary anymore. He already did it when we were non-Christians, when we were in the world. Okay? So he was our intermediary. He was our mediator before we were born again. Now that we're born again, we don't need a mediator because we're now children of God. And we use his name. We live in him. We're in his house. We're in him. And he is in us. The world, the non-Christians, need a mediator. And their mediator is Jesus Christ. And that's what we preach to them. We tell them, Jesus Christ brings you salvation. Jesus Christ reconciles you to God. You see it? So they need to receive that reconciliation. And once they receive it, they become like us, who have the ministry of reconciliation. So we are now the mediators, as it were, with Jesus Christ, together on one side. You get it? Okay, so that's very important. We have a book titled Praying the Right Way. Praying the Right Way, a book, um, one of our books. So you can ask for it and you get better details because you just read an article on our website. Now you can have even more benefit through that book.
All right, Israel from the United Kingdom. Hello, Pastor. I watched you on television today, and as I am so depressed about life and not sure what to do, I decided to seek your advice. I have had it difficult in terms of family and jobs. I have sought God's help many times. However, nothing changes. I have reached a point where I can find no solution. Please advise me. What is God's purpose for me, and why have I had difficulties in life? I'm deeply touched by your, your question here, and, uh, but I've got an answer for you from God's Word, and I want you to listen to this very carefully. The last part of your question is where I want to begin from. You said, please advise me, what is God's purpose for me, and why have I had difficulties in life? Why have I had difficulties in life? There are many people who have, who have uh, a chain of difficulties in life continually having life hard why should they have a hard life let me read something to you from Proverbs chapter 13 there are two reasons why people have difficulties like this in life even if the Christians and I'll read the first one to you from Proverbs chapter 13 verse 15 good understanding give it favor but the way of transgressors is hard he says good understanding give it favor good understanding you now the Bible says get wisdom get understanding with all I get in, he says to get understanding. Understanding God's word. You know, in Jesus' parable of the sower, he said the, the, the seeds, the first set of seeds fell by the wayside. He said the birds came and picked them up. And when he explained that, he said, those who receive seed by the wayside are those who hear the word of God and don't understand it. And so Satan comes immediately and steals still the word of God that was sown in their hearts. They couldn't understand the word. So he says to understand it. Now he says good understanding gives favor. Good understanding gives favor. Because if you have understanding, you function according to your understanding. You're living right now according to your understanding of things. And that's a big problem. Because it means you lack the true and adequate spiritual understanding of God's word and how the kingdom functions. Now, the next part of it is very, very um, insightful. It says here, but the way of transgressors is hard. Now, the Bible describes sin as the transgression of the law. To transgress the law means that you violate the law. Now, this definition is given to us over in the New Testament rather than in the Old. It's the same. In the Old Testament, transgressing the law would mean transgressing the commandments given by Moses. In the New Testament, there was only one law that Jesus gave, which was the law of love. Now, after you're born again and the Holy Spirit has come to live within you, you discover it's really no longer a law. Yet it's a law. It's a law in the mind. But in the spirit, it has become a reality. Because the Bible says, the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. Now, that law actually is the law of love. Which means that God has called us to work and function in love. Now, if you don't function in love, you are a transgressor. Which means you're transgressing the law of the New Testament. Which is love. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you. That you love one another as I loved you. A new commandment. This is a new commandment. And he gave them this commandment before they were born again. Because while he was giving them that commandment, he hadn't gone to the cross. It wasn't possible for anyone to be born again until Jesus was born again, raised from the dead, that is. Now, after Jesus came out of the grave, it became possible when the Holy Spirit came to make anyone to receive that salvation and be born again. And with that, when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, the love of God is shed abroad in your heart. And you can function in it. It becomes your natural way of life. But you've got to do it. You've got to act it. Now, 
If you don't live in love, if you don't walk in love, you are a transgressor. That is the New Testament transgressor. And the Bible says the way of transgressors is hard. So you're going to have to look at your life. Turn the searchlight on your life and see, are you walking in love towards those around you? Are you walking in love towards fellow believers? Are you walking in love? What's your language like when you talk to others? Or do you vent your anger and frustration continually on others? That might be the reason things have continually been hard for you. Because it says the way of transgressors is hard. The second reason is ignorance. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6 tells us, My people, let me read it to you. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Now, that's very powerful. I, there's so much for me to say to you there. But I just want to pick out the first part of it, which says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. For lack of knowledge. You see, they are destroyed. They are defeated. They are crushed. For lack of knowledge. What knowledge is he dealing with? He's not talking here of ordinary human knowledge. He's talking about the knowledge of spiritual things. The knowledge of God. The Bible says to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To grow in grace. If you're growing in grace, it means you're growing in favor. But remember what we read. Good understanding gives favor. That means good understanding will bring you what? More grace. Like the Bible says, he gives more grace. So he says to grow in grace. If you're going to grow in grace, it means you have to have more understanding of God's word. And that is very, very important today. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Now what are you going to do? Start learning God's word. Get the tapes. Get the books. Study the books. Listen to the message. Hear God's word. Put it to work. Act on it. Live by it. Be sure to increase in spiritual knowledge. See, remember that the spirit world controls the physical world. See, and you can control the physical things in your life from the realm of the spirit. But that will remain a cliche to you without ever coming into reality until you actually have the understanding of God's word. You know, there's something else that I'd like to read to you, and it's in the book of Joshua. Chapter 1, the young man Joshua had just begun the ministry and the Lord showed him how to be a success. In verse 8, chapter 1, he says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Notice what he said to you. He says, this book of the law. Now, in our day, the, this book of the law would be the word of God. All of God's word. Because at that time, all they had was the law. But now we have all of God's word. The whole revelation has been given to us. See? And um, uh, particularly, particularly, the instructions we have, the revelations we have over in the New Testament, in the epistles, Particularly, you can learn from all the others, but particularly you have great revelation for the Christian walk in the epistles. Now he says, this book of the Lord shall not depart out of thy mouth. You're going to have to learn to talk God's word. But you can't talk God's word until it is resident in your heart. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So he says, this book of the Lord shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein. He tells you the results. If you do this, if you meditate continually in God's words, say, then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Can you see it's your responsibility? If you do this, he says, you will make your way prosperous. Your life will no longer be hard. This is your responsibility. You can make your life prosperous. Then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success good success so it's not about god wanting you to succeed or not wanting you to succeed he's already i mean you're a child of god he wants you to be a success and he's shown you how
then from the United States. Dear Pastor, thank you so much for who you are. My question is one that has bothered me for so long. And as I watch your message, How to Shine, this question arises again. I know we are being taught to get scriptures to deal with challenges we may be facing and use it to conquer them. But what do I do when it's a multitude of challenges? Health, finances, my faith, wisdom and direction, strength and so on. Which scriptures do I use to deal with all these at once? Or do I deal with them one after the other? If so, in which order do I tackle them? Thank you, sir. <laughs> well, um, mm -hmm. he said, I know we're being taught to get scriptures to deal with challenges. You're not being taught to get scriptures to deal with challenges. That's the erroneous idea. And actually, that's why you're getting a bit confused. Here's the point. The scriptures are not being used to deal with problems. The scriptures communicate to you the thoughts of God, the mind of God, and they bring to you the ministry of the word. So that when that ministry works in your spirit and you have an understanding of God's word in your spirit, you understand his will and purpose, then you can function with the wisdom of God. And now, that wisdom will deal with all manner of problems by the anointing, by the direction of God's Spirit. That's what you need. See, you don't need to deal with the problems like one after the other. No. You need to bring the Word into your spirit. It will strengthen your spirit. It will give you direction. And you'll be able to deal with all manner of problems in the same way. Maybe this should be clear to you. All problems are really the same. They're not different. They're all the same. They're all the same. They just show up in different ways. But they're all the same. And that's why Jesus is called the Word of God. He's the seed of God. And He came as God's answer to every problem. He is one answer to all questions and to all problems. So, don't look at it like trying to get scriptures to deal with problems. No, get the scriptures into your heart to understand the mind and purpose of God, the will of God. Have the word in you to produce in you the wisdom of God and you will deal with all kinds of problems. They don't have to be in any particular order. Robert from Lebanon. What must I do to grow in faith? Secondly, I hear people say God can do all things. Is that true? Of course, he can do all things. If he couldn't, he wouldn't be God. Now, that is different from saying that God will do all things. He can do anything, but he will not do everything because he's left some for you to do. So uh, remember that. And then apart from that, you know, we say God can do anything, but he will not do evil because it's not consistent with his nature. He will only do those things that are consistent with his nature. Now, what are those things that are consistent in, with his nature? First, what does God, what is the description of God's nature? The Bible says two important things. Number one, he says, God is good. Which means anything that is not consistent with goodness is inconsistent with God's nature. So God's not going to do anything that's not good because he is good. Number two, God is love. Anything that's inconsistent with love, God will not do because it will be inconsistent with his nature. See that? So when you put this together, you find the third one that comes, which is that God is light. And the Bible says in him, there's no darkness at all. See, so um, he will only do those things that are consistent with his nature. He can do anything. John. John says, I live in a foreign country where I pastor a fellowship. I have observed over time that most of the people that come to fellowship with us are those of our own race. But we preach to everyone. How can I bring people of different nationalities to us? 
because we have people of different nationalities in this country aside from the others. Okay, great. Well, it depends on what you're preaching. What is the gospel? The gospel is for everybody. If you preach the gospel according to the scriptures, it'll be for everyone. Now, that doesn't mean that um, those that are listening to you may not be, um, uh, may not have uh, some racial prejudice. But if you minister the word of God in truth, it will break the barriers. And it will separate between those that are in bondage to the demon of racial prejudice from those who want truth. Truth has no color. Truth has no race. Truth is truth. The word of God has no color. All right? So share the word of God and share it with everybody. The problem is sometimes it is even those who are sharing the word of God that try to decide who they want to preach to. See? And that can be a problem. Reach out to everyone. There are hurting people of all nations and nationalities. They are hurting people. They're hurting people in every city. Reach out to hurting people. Win them. Begin with those who are in need of all nationalities. And the Word of God will produce results in their lives. Go out where the need is and you will find that you have results. But never be intimidated by those who are, um, who are, who have racial uh, prejudice, racial discrimination, because those people are actually blind. They are, they have some demonic problems. No one who's free in the spirit of God's word um, has a, a problem with race. See, those who think race are yet to know Christ. They're yet to be set free in their spirit. They're still in bondage. As long as you are saying, I am of this and I'm of this, I'm of this, you are earthly and carnal because it's all the outward expression. When you talk about race, it's about your body. It's about your features. How do you describe one of any race? You describe a man of any race by his physical features. And how sad that is. Paul said, I had known Christ after the flesh. And when he knew Christ after the flesh, he was in bondage. But then he says, now, henceforth, know we know man after the flesh. You have to come out from that worldliness of recognizing people according to the physical features. They're earthly features. Only earthlings do that. When you become spiritual, you lay aside childish things. Praise God. Hallelujah. Gertrude from South Africa. Dear Pastor, are we supposed to consider the Sabbath? When is the Sabbath exactly? And what are we supposed to do on that day? I ask because in Matthew 24, Jesus says we should pray that his coming will not be on a Sabbath. Okay. Well, the Sabbath is a day of rest uh, in the Jewish calendar. It's the, the seventh day, the last day of the week. And the Bible says on the seventh day, God rested when you study in his uh, account of creation in the book of Genesis. It tells us what he did on the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day, and the seventh day. Then it says on the seventh day, God rested. And so when he gave the laws by Moses to the children of Israel, he told them to rest on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, and that they should do no work. Now, Jesus came in and fulfilled the law and abolished it. And we don't have to live by that law of Moses anymore. In fact, it was never given to those who were non-Jews. It was only given to those who were Jews. So, but it's been abolished by Jesus. And so we function in his new law of love today. Now, here's the important thing. You said in St. Matthew's Gospel, Jesus said that we should pray that his coming should not be on the Sabbath. 
He actually said that they pray that their flight will not be on the Sabbath. And I will read it to you. It's in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, and verse 20. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Why did he say that? Because it will be difficult for them. He was addressing the Jews, and I want you to remember that. He was ad addressing the Jews here. And um, he was talking about when the, um, the desolation that Daniel the prophet talked about. When Israel is invaded. That's what he was talking about. And so he said, pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath. So, because uh, the, the Jews had a, uh, a limit on how far you could travel on the Sabbath day. In fact, they placed the limit on one mile. You couldn't go beyond one mile on the Sabbath day. So, if the flight took place, that's their escape. He wasn't really talking about going to Jesus in, at his coming, but the escape from their enemies, the invading enemies. He said, if that day is on the Sabbath, then you can't run very far. You can't move very far because the, the, the Orthodox Jew believe that on the Sabbath day, you shouldn't travel more than one mile. See? And that was really uh, the reason Jesus mentioned that. But beyond all of that, we, your question, you want to know what do we do on the Sabbath day today? The Sabbath day is no longer a day for the Christian because the law has been fulfilled by Jesus and abolished. And now what he says for us to do is to live every day unto him, unto Christ. But then you notice all around the world, most Christians, most Christians worship primarily on Sundays. Uh, how did they come about that? Was it that the Sabbath was moved from Saturday to Sunday? No. The Sabbath wasn't moved from Saturday to Sunday. But a day was picked by the early disciples to meet as God's children. And it was significant that they picked the first day of the week because that was the day of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was raised from the dead on the first day of the week. I want to read something to you from in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, from verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, that means the Sabbath was the last day of the week, of the outgoing week. So, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. And then it goes on to tell us about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But I want you to know, uh, to notice there, the Sabbath day ending and the first day of the week coming in because of what I want to say next. And uh, we'll go to the book of Acts chapter 20. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow and continue his speech until midnight. See, oh, it says that the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. So it was a special day, the first day of the week. That day that Jesus was raised from the dead. The day of his resurrection. That's the first day of the week. Now, the Christians marked that day and began to gather together. And that's very important for us to remember. First Corinthians chapter 16, I'll read from verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God had prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. It's talking about the, the disciples um, putting offerings together. For a purpose, there was something they wanted to do. But he says they would gather, they would meet on that day, the first day of the week. They'll bring their offerings on that day, the first day of the week. See, so the first day of the week was uh, a, a special time for the early disciples. They picked that day. In fact, they called it the Lord's Day. I want to read that to you from 
the book of Revelation, chapter 1, from verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. That's the first day of the week he was talking about. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And you remember, he had been banished to the island of Patmos. And while he was there, he says he was in the Spirit. So, um, this, is, this is what it is today. We meet generally on Sundays. Now, that doesn't mean we don't meet on other days. We do meet on other days, as the Bible also shows. The early disciples met. In fact, sometimes they met every day. See, they met every day. Breaking bread. Every day. So, you could do that as well. You could pick any day of the week. And um, don't let, let me read something else to you that I believe will be helpful to you. In Colossians chapter number 2, reading to you from verse 16. It says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holiday or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. See, so he's letting us know that the, the choice of the Sabbath was a shadow. It was a shadow of things to come. It was a type of the real. And now Christ has come and things have to change according to what the Spirit of God wants us to do over in the New Testament. So, if you, if you notice this, is let no man judge you therefore in meat, in the kind of food you you to eat, or uh, the kind of drink, or in respect of a holiday, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. See? So, he's telling you this doesn't matter anymore. Praise God. Pastor, please, can you shed light on sin consciousness and how to overcome it? Sin consciousness is the consciousness of condemnation or the, the consciousness of inferiority. When you come to Christ, he gives you righteousness. And righteousness is the very opposite of that sin consciousness. It brings you into a consciousness of oneness with the Father. It brings you into a consciousness of acceptance in the kingdom of God. You realize that you are accepted. You are awakened to the reality of his kingdom and to the fatherhood of God. You, you, you are awakened to your sonship. That's righteousness. See, And you find that you can stand in the presence of God without a sense of guilt or inferiority or condemnation. But not to have this and to be conscious of rejection, to be conscious of condemnation, to feel like God doesn't want you or because you did something wrong and you carry that consciousness of guilt. This is what we mean by sin consciousness. Even after God has forgiven you, you can carry that consciousness of guilt. Now you said, how to overcome it? By becoming righteousness conscious the way I just described righteousness to you you become righteousness conscious you recognize that when God says something he means it for example God said in first John chapter 1 when you read from verse 9 he says if we confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness hey he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us he's faithful and just that means you can trust him you can trust him to forgive and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Whether you feel he's done it or not, the feeling has nothing to do with it. You trust his word. So give up your consciousness of sin and become conscious of his righteousness, that he is righteous. See, the Bible says for us to acknowledge that he is righteous and the righteousness of him that believes in Jesus. I want to read something for you, uh, to you that may... That I'm sure will be helpful to you. In 1st John chapter 3. From verse 19. And hereby we know that we are of the truth. And shall assure our hearts before him. Think about that. Hereby we know that we are of the truth. Then he says in verse 20. For if our heart condemn us. God is greater than our heart. And knoweth all things. So if your heart condemns you, if you find that you're conscious of sin, even after you've asked God or actually obtained forgiveness, all right, if, if, you, 
if you've if you've asked the Lord oh, um, to forgive you and then you say I don't know if he's forgiven me it means you haven't obtained it you didn't actually receive forgiveness so what you do is you obtain you receive you accept forgiveness okay now to do that means that you have to accept that God is not only willing to forgive you he's already done it now he says here if your heart still condemns you because your heart can condemn you when your heart is not trained in the things of God your heart will condemn you see and Satan can talk to you you can hear the voice of the devil talking to you to condemn you your own mind can condemn you so the Word of God says if our heart condemn us God is greater than our hearts and knoweth all things God knows all things he's aware of all and so when you say Lord I receive forgiveness in the name of Jesus you are forgiven but in your mind and in your heart because you are still unstable about the things of God you may still feel condemned you may think condemned the next thing he says for you to do is accept that God is greater and because God is greater than your heart trust him rather than the condemnation that you feel in your heart then he says in verse 21 beloved if our heart condemn us not then have we confidence toward God see if we don't have that condemnation within us we are confident that's why the sense of righteousness is very important the consciousness of righteousness it brings you confidence in life if you're not conscious of righteousness and you become conscious of sin you lose confidence you become ineffective and inefficient in the things of God so make sure you are righteousness conscious can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. from United Kingdom. He says, Hi, Pastor Chris. I've listened to your teachings on the wonderful name of Jesus. What about the blood of Jesus? Is it scriptural to pray? I come against you by the blood of Jesus. As some Christians pray. Pastor Uche. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. Pastor, the Bible says that God has highly exalted Christ and given him a name. That is above every name, that at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee bows. And the scripture tells us 
that we pray in the name of Jesus and not with the blood of Jesus. God has given us a name. And Jesus himself said to us that now I go to the Father. And when I go to the Father, he said, you shall ask the Father in my name. And so we, the blood, the blood was what did it for us. But we were not given the blood to operate with. <laughs> we were given the name. We were not given the blood to call upon, right? <laughs> yes. Sir. Yeah. The, the blood made it possible, made all of that blessing and position possible. And um, uh, it's important for us to recognize that. We'll go on a short break, and when we'll come back, we'll answer this question more fully. Thank you. All right. Now, um, I'll just remind you of the last question from Ebenezer from the UK. The wonderful name of Jesus. He says, what about the blood of Jesus? Is it scriptural to pray, I come against you by the blood of Jesus, as some Christians pray? Now, you know, the Bible tells us, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Doesn't mean that they were proclaiming the blood of Jesus in prayer. Uh, and some others say, I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus. The way to plead the blood of Jesus is by the Holy Communion. Take the communion, and that's pleading the blood of Jesus. That's what he said for us to do about the blood. So when you, you make your faith declarations on the word of God as you take the communion, that's how to plead the blood of Jesus. You don't say, I plead the blood of Jesus over the devil. I plead the blood of Jesus over me. You don't need to do that. See, because you were already saved by the blood of Jesus. Now, he told us to use his name against demons. That's enough. The name of Jesus is enough. You don't need to add anything else. The name of Jesus has power over all devils. When we say there's there's power in the blood of Jesus, we don't mean that demons are running away because of the blood. Understand it. All of that teaching doesn't have place in the word of God. See? So if you say the blood of Jesus, demons don't run because you say the blood of Jesus. No, the blood of Jesus means something to you. And what it means is that that blood brought you into Christ because it saved you. The blood was shed for the remission of sins. That was what was necessary for the remission of sins. And the blood was the purchasing power for your soul. The Bible says we were not bought or saved by precious uh, stones or silver or gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So when it says you're bought with the price, that's what it means. You're bought with the blood of Jesus. That means his blood was shed for your salvation. It doesn't mean that, that, that he paid the blood by giving the blood to someone. You see, what it means is that that blood was shed for the remission of sins. That had to be shed for you to be saved. Now you are saved. Now the blood has done its work. You live not by the blood of Jesus. You live by the name of Jesus. You pray in the name of Jesus. You cast out devils in the name of Jesus. So that's what you do now. So we believe in the sanctity of the blood of Jesus Christ. We believe in the redemptive power of the blood of Jesus Christ. In the salvation that's given to us by the blood of Jesus Christ. But we don't pray by the blood of Jesus. For the word of God doesn't tell us to do so. David from Ghana is asking, is it by faith? Is it by faith that Ruth followed Naomi or love? <laughs> nice quiz. 
Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Pastor, I think you just shared something with us about the creative forces of the spirit, faith, hope, and love. And I think she followed uh, Naomi by faith, by hope, <laughs> and by love. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I remember in that message you told us that, because I was at the night of this, you said, faith is for today, hope is for tomorrow, and love is for all time. Mm -hmm. And definitely she would have needed all that to do what she did. Yes. Uh, to follow uh, Naomi like that, um, she loved her, of course. She, she appreciated that. She loved how that woman had taken care of her. And she, she didn't know what was going to happen. She didn't know what the future was going to be. So she hoped for the best. And they were going back to Naomi's country. She had faith in going with her. So your question is a good one. And when you say, did, she, did Ruth follow Naomi by faith or by love? Both of them. Yes. And she had hope. <laughs>
to be with him always. Great. David from Ghana is asking, is it by faith? <laughs> is it by faith that Ruth followed Naomi or love? <laughs> nice quiz. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Pastor, I think you just shared something with us about the creative forces of the Spirit, faith, hope, and love. And I think she followed uh, Naomi by faith, by hope, <laughs> and by love. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I remember in that message you told us that, because I was at the night of this, you said, faith is for today, hope is for tomorrow, and love is for all time. Mm -hmm. And definitely she would have needed all that to do what she did. Yes. Uh, to follow uh, Naomi like that, um, she loved her, of course. She, she appreciated that. She loved how that woman had taken care of her. And she, she didn't know what was going to happen. She didn't know what the future was going to be. So she hoped for the best. And they were going back to Naomi's country. She had faith in going with her. So your question is a good one and when you say did she did Ruth follow Naomi by faith or by love both of them yes and she had hope Chizoba from Nigeria says pastor I am always confused when my friends ask me why we have female pastors in our church when the Bible says first in 1 Corinthians that women should not speak in the house of God. You know, the people who are always going to ask questions, they're always going to ask um, questions not because they want to know, but because they want to condemn you. So maybe that's why they're asking you this, this kind of questions. But I, I'll give you an answer so you can deal with them um, when they talk to you. In first, get the scriptures I'm going to give you. They will help you. First Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 and 35 is where that portion is that you are referring to. So I'm going to read it to you. First Corinthians chapter 14. And from verse 34, he says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will, watch this, and if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Uh-oh. But what about those that don't have husbands? They can't ask nobody at home. Now, did you notice, it says, if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. That means they shouldn't ask questions in church. And here he's talking to those who have husbands. This begins to give us an idea of what Paul was talking about. Remember, the word of God does not contradict itself. If God meant... That all women should be silent in the churches and they should not speak. If that's what he meant, then consider these other scriptures. I want you to go to, let's begin with the same chapter, 1 Corinthians, the same chapter 14. Go to verse 4. Verse 4. First Corinthians chapter 14, we're reading verse 4. He says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edified himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. He says, If you prophesy, you are edifying the church. Okay? All right, go to verse 12. Same book, same chapter. Even so, ye, 
for as much as he has zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that he may excel to the edifying of the church. So he says, no matter what gifts you got, he says, hey, I want you to seek to the edifying of the church. And the topmost of the gifts to edifying the church that he mentions is the gift of prophecy. He says prophecy edifies the church. And he tells us to seek to edify the church. I want you to keep this in perspective. All right. Now, go to the book of Acts, chapter 21. Book of Acts, chapter 21. And I want to read to you from verse 8. He says, and the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man, Philip the Evangelist, had four daughters unmarried, which prophesied. Uh-oh. Four daughters that prophesied? He says, Philip the evangelist had four daughters that prophesied. We just read that prophecy edifies the church. We just read that we were told to covet the gift of prophecy. That means God has done something wrong for giving these four ladies the gift of prophecy. Because he, he gave them the gift of prophecy. The Bible says four to one is given by the Spirit. The gift of prophecy. So if God gave this woman the gift of prophecy, has he done something wrong? He must have done something wrong if it's wrong for them to edify the church because prophecy is used in edifying the church. And prophecy is used in teaching. Prophecy is used in exhorting. Prophecy is used in comforting. Think about it. And these four women prophesied. What does prophecy do for you? Go again to verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We're reading verse 3. All right? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. The gift of prophecy is used for all of this. So, and this, this, this four ladies had the gift of prophecy. Who gives the gift of prophecy? The Holy Spirit. Has he contradicted himself? He says you use the gift of prophecy in the church to edify, to comfort, to exhort. And then he gave this to these four women. Let me show you another thing. 1 Corinthians in chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonored her head. Now, look at that. Every woman that prayeth or prophesieth. That means God recognized them that they pray and prophesy. Can you imagine he put the two there on the same level? Praying, prophesying. Every woman that prays, that prophesies. With her head uncovered. Now he even gives some instructions about the covering of hair and so on and so forth. He didn't say it was wrong for the woman to prophesy. This all means that what you thought Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verses 34 and 35 about women not speaking in church didn't mean they cannot prophesy, they cannot teach. That's not what he meant. What he was talking about was that if they had something to ask that was private, they should do that at home, not in the church. All right? Not in the church. So if you're, if you're in church, listen to the word. If you want to ask questions, he says, ask when you get home. That's what he said. So don't, um, don't assume that he's forbidding God's children from uh, speaking. Remember, he also told us in the book of Acts, 
chapter 2, when he talked about the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, he said, in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. He didn't say, and your sons alone shall prophesy. And he told us that prophecy is for the church. It edifies the church. So if your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, then where are the women supposed to do theirs? Since prophecy is for the church. All right. So, um... Those are the questions that we can take for now. And we're going to have to move into some other segment of the program. If you, do, if you still have questions, now intelligent questions, questions that can help you build your Christian life. Don't ask stupid questions. Ask good questions that you can use in building yourself in the things of God. All right? And um, if you ask such questions, we will be willing to help you and guide you to understand the Word of God. We've got several beautiful materials to help you in your Christian life. For example, we have this Bible Seminar 2. Now, we had Bible Seminar 1 and lots of beautiful things in that, uh, in that um, series of teachings. Now, we've got a new series, and it's Bible Seminar 2. For example, the one I'm holding here is titled Contending for the Faith. There are several other titles under this series in the Bible Seminar 2. You need this. It's very important that you get yours. Place your order today. And um, when the copies come to the churches, make sure that you get yours. Now, we also have another beautiful material here. This is Sinatch, a new album from Sinatch. One of the foremost worship leaders in the world, Sinatch. And the title of this one is From Glory to Glory. From glory to glory. And this particular audio CD includes two hours of live worship. My goodness, you'll never be the same again. Think about it. Make sure you get yours today. Two hours of live worship and then, of course, behind the scenes documentary. You'd love this. Make sure you place your order for Sinatch from glory to glory. Praise God. I think this is a DVD, by the way. This is, a, this is a DVD, and uh, there's a, a special bonus audio CD included in it. So you'll enjoy this. Glory to God. Now, mm. Kitsi from Cameroon. This is Shalom, Pastor. I'm blessed to be treated by you. Please, Pastor, how shall we be in heaven? <laughs> shall we be spirits in bodies just as on earth? Because you've taught us that God has given us the body to function on earth. Will the bodies still be useful in heaven or not? Thank you, sir. Wonderful. Uh, to that... Um the Bible says, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, that we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And it says, in this we groan, earnestly desire to be clothed upon with a house that's coming from above. But then in 1 Corinthians 15, the Bible clearly says, there are celestial bodies, and their bodies terrestrial. Meaning that the bodies which, which will function on earth now are called terrestrial bodies. That is the one the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians from, um, 2 Corinthians 5 from verse 1, that will be dissolved eventually. But then there's a celestial body that's coming to us from above. Mm -hmm. That's one with, with which we rule and with which we function in heaven. That one cannot function on earth here because it's a celestial body. So that's the one with which we operate in heaven. Yes. And if you're wondering when, when, is that, when are you going to have that body, the Bible says when the trumpet of the Lord sounds. He says, the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible. And we that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. He says, we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. He says, it's going to be so fast. And our physical earthly bodies will be changed to the celestial bodies. And then we go with the Lord to be with him always great um. you 
you can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now.